alone here in the classroom. <laughs> okay. Uh, look, it's so different here. It's 14 degrees, whereas where you are, it's about 40 uh, degrees plus? No, no, no. Today it's around 32, 33. Okay. But it is 14 degrees there, very cold. It's getting cold. It's autumn. So you know that yes, it's yes, a yes. flip side uh, of what's happening in the northern hemisphere. So, um, yes, I wish there was a way in which, you know, we could have um, the temperature from um, India and the temperature from here becoming <laughs> somehow balanced. Remove pin coro. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, all our students are here, so we can start. Uh, okay. I, I believe all of you can hear us. Can everyone hear us? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. This is great. And and if it is possible for you all, uh, you may switch on your camera. If it is possible, if there is a problem, no worries. If it is possible. Maybe, Sharbhujit, even if it's just for a minute so yes. that we can see their faces and say exactly. hello, exactly. that would be great. Uh, I think what we can do is uh, I would request all of you to just switch on your camera and introduce yourself. That would be great. I think, yes, just tell us your name and I think then we can move on to our class. Mm hmm. Uh, okay, I, I think I'll call out names as I see it. Uh, participants to Dikta Vachinagana. Yeah. Onkita Patro. Onkita. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, yes. ma'am. I'm Unkita Bhatia. Hi, Unkita. Lovely Hello, background. Thank you. Uh, Thank Vidushi. You. Switch on your microphone. Am I visible? Uh, not yet. We cannot hear you. Am I visible now? Okay. I think we'll come back to her later. Uh, Ishita. Am I uh, visible? Yes, Ishita can see you. Hello, uh, hello ma'am. Good afternoon. Good to meet you. Okay. Uh, Koel. Hello, ma'am. Hi, Koel. How are you? I'm fine. Ma'am, how are you? Good, 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 good to meet you. Um, uh, then Manushi. Is it okay, sir? Hmm. Can't see you, Manushi. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. How are you, Manushi? Ma'am, fine. What about you? Excellent. Good. Looking forward to talk, talking to you later on. Thank you. Follow me. Hello, ma'am. Hi, Follow me. Looking Very forward to... Good morning, ma'am. Yes. Very good My morning My name is Follow me, Deoguria. Lovely to meet you, Follow me. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Rimpa. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Hi, Good. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank Ria, you. Ria. Hi, Ria. Good afternoon. Ria, she was talking previously. Okay. Okay, we will go to Shankar. Uh, if you can do Hi, this. Nice to meet you. Hi, Shankar. Good to meet you too. Uh, Shormishta. Hello, ma'am. Hi, Sharmishta. Good to meet you. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Busy morning. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, mm -hmm. I am Sharmishta De. Yes. Nice to, Good to meet you, Sharmishta. Thank you, ma'am. Shilpa. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Shilpa. Busy day today. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Shilpa. Shomeshwar. Hi, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Hi, Shomeshwar. Mm -hmm. um, good to meet you. Looking forward to a good conversation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. last but not the least, Shubhanalata. Mm -hmm. Shubhanalata, are you there? Hi, Hi Shubhanalata. Can't see you, but can hear your voice. Shubhanalata, ma'am. Nice Hi, to Shubhanu. meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Okay, thank now, you. Now, uh, that was the last one, Chandrajit? Yes, yes, yes. That's the last student. Oh, look, it's such a pleasure to see everyone. You know, every time you have one of these Zoom meetings, all you see is a black square with your names written on it. And it's very disappointing sometimes. Now I get to know your names. I get to, I've met you now. So I'm going to slowly move on to the discussion for today. So I'll begin by sharing the screen. And please remember one thing that uh, this is meant to be an interactive kind of um, session. Yes, yes. So, yes. so um, uh, yeah, please enable this, uh, the screen sharing, Chalbhaji. Yes, I've done that. Excellent. Okay, so here we are. Um, I'm going to start by looking at some, some of these slides, just to give you an idea of what's happening here. We're going to be talking about Of Indian Origin. This is a book, and um, I'm the co-editor of it along with Paul Sherrod, who hasn't been able to make it to today's session, but he's here in spirit. So what we're going to do is we will begin by looking at five poems. So if you look at the anthology that we have here, there are about 14 poets and there are about 39 poems. And obviously, it's not uh, going to be easy to discuss all of them. So we've selected five poets, um, five poems as well, um, just to be able to um, get a sense of diasporic writing, uh, diasporic poetry, particularly in Australia, written by Indian, uh, Indian poets. When I say Indian, I think I'm not doing justice to it because some of these writers, although they are, we're calling them Indians, some of them, and I go on to the next slide, um, have unique biographies. Some are creative writers uh, who wrote from Fiji, for example, 
one of the poems that we're going to look at is Satendra Nandan's poem. Michelle Cahill, again, another poet we're going to discuss, was born in Kenya, studied in the UK, and uh, later come, came to Australia and lives and works here. Then you have Pooja Mittal, who is a Nigerian born writer, who again studied in the UK and came to us via New Zealand. So that's briefly the biography of some of the poets that we're going to read about today and talk about today. And then of course, you will find that in the uh, anthology, we have also featured writers like Kiyar Srinivasan Ayer, who is, um, as you know, a leading, was a leading um, critic of Indian literature, Indian English literature, particularly. And then, of course, we have Maria Preeti Srinivas, uh, who passed through Australia. And um, while here, she wrote some poems that are anthologic are part of the anthology. We also have um, poets who are themselves, I don't know whether they would call themselves Indians, but they have a parent who is an Indian. So they've been included too. So I'll begin with the story of how we went about selecting um, the creative pieces that we did. Uh, firstly, the first criteria that we used was that the creative text, whether it was a piece of short fiction, short story, or a poem, had to have aesthetic appeal. That is, uh, we wanted it to be um, a good poem by any standards. So the form, the language, the structure, um, is something that we looked at in terms of, did it hit the mark? Did it make the grade? Okay, so we wanted to look at um, outstanding pieces of work. The other thing that we were interested in is, did the creative work or the poem, or whether it was the fiction or poem, did it actually capture in some way or the other the diasporic experience? Um, again, I become a little self-conscious when I speak about diaspora, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So diaspora in Greek means to disperse. And as you know, um, human beings have crossed borders for all kinds of reasons throughout the ages, whether it was economic, social, or political. Um, you know, people have you know, cross borders, gone to different countries for trade, as refugees, just for curiosity, colonization, and so forth. So it is almost, you could say, an elemental human condition. Now, a critique and a writer himself, uh, Jeet Tahil, talks about um, the term diaspora. He says, yes, di you know, if it's a human condition, the impact of the word diaspora, maybe 100 years ago when it wasn't easy for people to travel from one place to another, um, the impact of a diaspora was strongly felt. But here, nowadays, we can move from one country to another within a very short span of time. You know, within 24 hours, I can be go from Sydney to uh, Mumbai. Uh, and so, you know, diasporic writing is not exiled writing. It's, it's, it's a very different breed, according to him. And it doesn't have, you know, homeland probably doesn't mean the same thing that it meant ages ago. So, despite all this, there are expectations, you know, the host country, for example, Australia would expect migrants to behave in certain ways. There'd be an expectation that migrants would assimilate and integrate into the Australian culture. 
So um, what does that mean? There would be an expectation that migrants begin to learn the language and begin to behave um, in ways that are acceptable to the Australian society. Now, because of that, what happens very often, and you will read it in the literature and, uh, uh, you know, in critical theories, particularly, um, that first generation migrants tend to hold on to the memories of their motherland. Second generation migrants are particularly keen to integrate and be part of the host country. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? ma'am. Okay. I just heard some disturbances. Maybe it's good to mute your um, mics till, I, till we sort of start the discussion. So are you with me so far? Do you get a gist of what, where we are going? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, I'm just repeating that point one more time, that first generation writers, their work tends to be marked by a sense of nostalgia and displacement, you know, um, writers want to find their place in the new, new world that they have come to. Whereas second generation writers might reflect more, reflect more global perspectives, more transnational perspective. And if you look at your introduction, uh, we touch upon that. Um, so while we're reading these poems, I'd like you to keep this in mind. Now, before we start talking about the poems in particular, I'd like to ask you, what do you like? What do you enjoy in a poem? You can unmute your mics if you have something to say, or you can use a chat line. What do you enjoy in a poem? What do you like? When you read a poem, what do you like? Ma'am, the thought that is there in the poem, the idea on which the poem is uh, written. Beautiful, the theme. Thank you. Thank you, Rimpa. Anyone else? Do you want to say what you like in a poem? Okay, I like the idea. The poem. The theme. I don't like the language. Yes. Yes, the language, the background, the language. Yeah, anything else? Manasi, thank you. Right, look, you've actually named two important things. You're looking at the themes and you're looking at language, right? So um, those are very important. Now, Whenever I look at a poem, personally, I look at the poem in, in terms of its form, its shape on the page. It's very important for me to see what a poem looks like on a page. Then I'd like to listen to it. Now, very often, it's hard to get someone to read the poem. If you're lucky, you might get um, a spoken poem on YouTube, etc. And I love that. I love listening to a poem. The other thing, uh, as um, Rimpa said, that the message of the poem is important. What message, what meaning, what theme is it talking about? That's important. The other thing is, um, you know, does it resonate with your experiences? You know, do you feel a connection with the theme of the poem? And then again, I mean, with, without putting too fine a point on it, there are times when, you know, you feel, oh, my God, this poem expresses exactly what I'm saying, what I need to, what I'm thinking about. But then sometimes you might like a poem, but it does not in any way reflect your thoughts or your way of thinking about something, but you still like it. So these are the things about poetry that are intriguing and, you know, it's, it's worthwhile thinking about these things. And then of course, um, just reading a poem is not enough. 
I guess you are made to write about it. You're made to, um, you have a tutorial, you have to respond to a question, or you might have, um, you know, exams where you write about it. So what is it um, that you have in terms of theories or frameworks that can be applied to a poem? So it's quite possible that you're looking at modernism uh, in order to understand a poem. So if you're talking about T.S. Eliot's work, for example, you would have read a little bit about modernism that might help you understand the poem better, unpack the poem better. So these are things worth considering. Okay, before I begin, um, can I just ask again, uh, and just yes, no, will do fine. Um, so far, so good. Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Now, the first poem that I wanted to look at is Meena Kashmiri Abdullah's Chapati chant. Um, have you read it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, good. Did you like it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, just a bit of background on the poem. It was one of the first poems uh, published. It was published in, I mean, first poems by in, uh, people of Indian origin to be published. It was published in 1955. Um, the theme, would you agree, is nostalgia for a stable experience among changes in one's life. Would you agree to that? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And it takes, the form is very conventional. It's a ballad and it's written in rhyming verses. And the impact of the poem, as I see it, is, is to provide a very calming to depict a picture of a very calming presence. And in this poem, it's the mother. And the one key thing that links to the motherland is the chapati. Yeah. Now, before we go on, and this is what I was trying to say, the world is, you know, for the migrant girl, imagine a migrant girl in 1955 in Australia. Um, you know, Australia those days was not particularly if you read the poem carefully, find um, that it wasn't all that friendly to migrants. Um, so one, one bit of comfort was the food and the mother making the food, the chapatis. Now, I'm just wondering whether I should um, share the poem with you or whether you have a memory uh, good enough to recall some of these things. You know, three things are mentioned in the poem, uh, three disturbing or distressing events are mentioned. Can you recall what they're, do you have the books in front of you or uh, the poems in front of you? Or should I share, share the poem with you? Yes, ma'am, we have. No, we do have the You text. have? Yes. Okay. So can you tell me what are the three disturbing events mentioned in the poem? Sure, ma'am. Ma'am, the racism mm -hmm. in school, uh, the one Exactly. Thing. Yes. And then uh, the, uh, the shed went up in flame, the second one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the rabbits tunnel through uh, the land of the, mm -hmm. that land. Yeah, the three, these three uh, things happened. Excellent. Um, and they're distressing, obviously. And all through that, what is one constant thing that happened? The mother figure making the chapatis for her family. Mm. And what, what does it mean to you? The mother, the mother making chapatis, what is it a sign of? What is it a symbol of? Um, 
Ma'am, affection and love for the family. Yes, very good. She also uh, reflects strength and uh, peace. Yeah, she reflects uh, strength. Uh, 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 yeah, strength, peace. What else? Someone has said, uh, Mansi has said, stickiness to her responsibility. Yes, she has stuck to the responsibility of nurturing her family. That's a very good point too. Excellent. Now, did you like the poem? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Liked it very much and just okay. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on because I'm just aware that we have a lot to do. So I'm going to move on to Satendra Nandan's uh, At the Surgery. Now, this uh, was published uh, in a collection of poems uh, written between 1976 and 2006. Mm -hmm. And it, have you read it? It picks on a very embarrassing time uh, of um, Australian, you know, uh, political situation. I don't know whether you've heard of Pauline Hanson. She's the leader of One Nation Party. And at one point of time in the 90s, um, her comment was Asians should go back to India. There are too many of them. So she didn't want Asians or Muslims in the country. Now, the poem that you, uh, you've read at the surgery uh, is in free verse. And the idea behind the poem is to give a tongue-in-cheek kind of comment on Australian life around that time. Okay. Now, again, ha have you read the poem? Yes, and mm, I'm going to ask you a few questions. What does surgery mean to you? Ma'am, operating something or executing something? Yeah, surgery in the way we understand surgery in India means an operation of some kind, right? Um, but surgery in Australia refers to um, a dispensary, what we call Dr. Khanna in India, uh, the doctor's place, right? So, um, here, we probably have to rethink the meaning of surgery for this poem. So having done that, how does, my next question is, how does the poet create the atmosphere in the surgery? How is he, you know, how does it, how do he, how does the author, how does the poet uh, convey the sense of a dispensary, for example? And there was a chart uh, for men uh, where it was yes. written that takes blood pressure and all that. Yeah, yeah. So this is a common thing everywhere in the world, isn't it? There are always charts on um, the walls of surgeries, etc. Um, what? Who do you think the Pauline girls refers to? We just heard the story of Pauline Hanson. So what do you think Pauline Girls refers to? Ma'am, it refers, it refers to white women who were prejudiced against migrants. Exactly. The two women uh, who are described in the poem are white women who are prejudiced against migrants. Now, how is the doctor described? What color is he? What um, ethnic background do you think he has? He is a Chinese man. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. And why why is it why do you think the poet actually describes the Chinese man? What's the significance of it? Ma'am, here he is uh, uh, like an immigrant. Yeah. 
He's an immigrant. Um, exactly. He's an immigrant. And uh, what do you think the Pauline girls think about him? As an outsider? Yeah. Exactly. That he's an outsider. They don't think that he's a doctor. They assume that he's a patient who's pushing his way into the doctor's room and, um, you know, taking up their line, their position in the queue, right? So when you see, you know, when they see him, um, they say, uh, we were here first, right? Um, how, what does that show you about, about these Pauline women? We, we here first. You must wait your turn in the queue. So what does that tell you? Ma'am, they thought that they are the first uh, here. First mm -hmm. citizen of Australia. Yes, that's why. No, and uh, also, it is a bit ironical because the white, uh, the whites, after reaching Australia, claim the land as no man's land, yes. and marginalize those who's, uh, who were uh, living there for more than sixty thousand years. Exactly. And ma'am, is there a cons? Is there a fear um, working? Uh, where they are in a constant fear of invisibilization, the way they have marginalized the Aboriginal people in Australia and absented their histories. They are in a similar fear of being absented and invisibilized by the Asians who uh, came later. Quite possible. And uh, what uh, you get there is, you know, uh, Pauline girls are being very condescending. They think that uh, you know, the, the Asian man is um, just another patient who is pushing his way through. But it is an ironical comment, you know, because, first of all, if you look at the line, we hear first, the English is also not correct, right? You would say, we were here first. So it could be two things, you know, it could be, a, as you said, irony, that they're not speaking their own language well. That could be one thing, or that they are condescending. They are being very rude uh, to this Chinese-looking person, um, doctor. Now, uh, moving on, uh, I'd like you to consider this line. He smiled, his breath breaking the bridge of time. What does it mean for you in the context of this poem? Breaking the bridge of time. So obviously, he is the doctor. And he's being very kind in the way he's approaching uh, the patients, uh, in this case, the Pauline girls. And the line there, the bridge breaking the bridge of, uh, sorry, his breath breaking the bridge of time. What does that indicate to you? You said it actually, one of you had the answer to it. Uh, there was this thing that you said about erasing um, the history of yes, the past. So can you go on and expand on it a bit? Ma so in the past, hmm? ma'am, please explain this. Okay, um, look, as you said, um, you know, the history of Aboriginal people were erased. There's discrimination there. The history of Chinese uh, people when they came to Australia, as you know, in the past, um, as um, 
laborers uh, during the gold rush, etc., as people who were seeking a fortune, etc. I mean, through that time, there was nothing but discrimination. And in this, at this point, here is the doctor with a Oxonian accent. You know, he was probably educated in Oxford. Um, and here is this person with a very elegant presence, uh, a doctor who now is coming back to treat, um, you know, the Pauline girls. So it's a, it's, the idea is to make them rethink about the stereotypes that we have, you know, that we have here about what a Chinese person, person should be doing, what, uh, uh, who's a doctor? Is it always a uh, white Australian? Of course not. I mean, the doctors that I meet come from all kinds of backgrounds, from, uh, you know, um, Syria, from um, China, from India. So what this poem does is it makes you think about the stereotypes that we have of different people in multicultural Australia and rethink our assumptions of what people are. Does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Thank you so much. Any questions? Or shall we move ahead? Shall we move ahead? We'll keep questions for later because there are three more poems that we have to go through and I'm aware that you're very tired. Please explain one second the bridge of time. What is the bridge? The bridge is probably, and you see, the bridge is um, not necessarily a bridge, you know, sometimes um, the bridge can be faulty. But here in this case, what I see it as is the assumptions that are made of, you know, ethnic people in Australia. That is something that we have to rethink, you know. So the link is, you know, it's the idea of, um, rethinking our assumptions about ethnic identity um, and to make a connection, okay? Ideally, the Pauline girls would have learned a lesson from this experience that, you know, um, all doctors need not be white doctors. And this is a Chinese doctor who's treating them. So life has changed. And within a span of centuries, uh, you know, ethnic people have taken on roles that were not meant to be, uh, were not considered to be uh, appropriate for ethnic people, you know. The idea was, oh, Chinese people will work in takeaway shops, um, you know, and in Chinese restaurants. But here is a Chinese uh, person who was probably changed, uh, you know, trained in Oxford or Cambridge and is here in Australia as a doctor. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a yeah. kind of, ex yeah, it's a way of uh, rethinking stereotypes. Yeah, that's the bridge that should happen. Moving on, um, the next poem that we're going to look at is Sumit fires over the rainbow. Now, um, do you know the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow? Okay. When I hear silence, it means that probably it's best to explain a bit. Um, okay. Uh, thanks, Rimpa. So I'll just give you a bit of a background to the song. Um, over the Rainbow, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, is a song from a musical film um, called The Wizard of Oz. Okay, Oz as in Australia. Um, it's, it's a fantasy novel that was writ written in the 1930s. And the story, and, uh, you know, you can look it up uh, on Google, etc., um, is about a young girl called Dorothy, um, who, along with her dog, is swept off in a tornado, and she has to travel 
the yellow brick road to find a home. Now, as part of a journey, she meets, during her journey actually, she meets very interesting characters and she uh, meets, eventually she meets the wizard. Now, the meeting of the wizard, etc., is in itself a non-event, but the significant thing is Dorothy learns a lot from the journey. She learns about herself, she learns about her companions, and in Australia and elsewhere, um, you know, the story of um, the Wizard of Oz becomes a kind of an allegory, a kind of a metaphor, a kind of a parallel for a journey, you know, that transforms people, that, you know, you go, you know, at the start of the journey, you're pretty innocent, you don't know much, but by the time you've completed the journey, you have learned a few lessons in life, you become wiser. So um, this is a story of uh, Over the Rainbow. And I think the poet, um, when she raises this as a title, she is inviting you to read a parallel between the poem that she's, she's you know, got with the journey of The Wizard of Oz. So the device that she's using, the um, method that she's using is that of intertextuality. And one of you said earlier that it is ironic, you know, that something was ironic. And intertextuality can be used in many ways, you know. In this case, it is, um, again, possibly an ironic use of over the rainbow, you know, the, the story of the Wizard of Oz. And the poet talks about her journey to India. Now, Sumedha is a second generation um, uh, writer. And in her work, you will find that she is, um, she uses form and structure in a very experimental way. To me, and I don't know whether it's whether you read it like that. To me, it reads um, like a play, you know, with a prologue at the beginning and an epilogue at the end. And there are about three or four acts right through. And she uses language in a very strange and interesting way. Um, if you are looking at, you know, words like uh, Morga and Morgan amniotic sack of nostalgia cradling your heart and you know there's an exactness of something which i think captures the meaning of what she's trying to say yeah um have you read the poem yes ma'am how did you like it yes ma'am you liked it was yes, it easy? The language is very easy and the ideas very interesting. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Okay, oh, wait, wait a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll just take you through it. Um, I would like you uh, to consider just the first... Um, First bit of the poem. I'm just wondering if I can share this with you. Um, can you see the poem? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Now, does anyone want to read it out aloud for me? Ipshita, do you want to try? Ma'am, it's Ishita. Sure, ma'am. Ishita, sorry. 
It's okay, ma'am. Sure. Would you would you like to read the poem? Sure, ma'am. Not the whole thing, just the first bit, okay? The first section. Over the rainbow. My father warned me before mom and I left. At dusk, we sat on the roof of our house and he assumed an avatar I had never seen before. They made me a murga instead of a murgan. Our gods are old and hard of hearing. Okay, it can you stop there for a minute? Sure. Ma what does murga stand for? I'm making, Hindi mein murga fool. Kya hai? I'm making someone fool. Exactly. So murga is chicken, right? And murugan, do you know what murugan, who murugan is? Murugan is in Tamil or in South India. Murugan is the name that Bengalis, we, we call uh, Kartik, right? And um, Murugan is an avatar of Kartik, okay? So made a fool of is a really good uh, way of summarizing it. Excellent. Can you go ahead, Ishita, sure, and read it? Our gods are old and hard of hearing. It made sense. He had always been a compass, a confused rooster atop, a rusted weather vane garlanded in bruised jacaranda. When I was young, the promise lay westward. Even in a storm, I pointed us there. He gave a low, guttural cluck. I had built that creaking idol from scraps, swept up by our mother's perfume. We left our chapels at the temple door. But at customs, they don't tell you that the cinemas don't smell like pakoras and hair oil, and that every time you go back to India, the amniotic sack of nostalgia cradling your heart bursts as you step into the fetid heat outside the airport. We sat there all night. With the red sky of the morning, my father crowed his, uh, crowed his warning, west and east on ten storms meet, especially when you roam. But Dorothy's red slippered feet can never take you home. Ishita, that was a beautiful reading. Thank you very much. Thank you so um, much. So, you know, here the writer is saying that, um, you know, West and East on tense terms meet. Uh, so do you think it's a, a very happy transition from being uh, in India to bring, being in Australia? What is the hint that you get there? Shankar, what do you think? Is it a happy kind of situation that they're talking about here? Yeah, so Rimba says no. And I think that's true because the hint here is that you know, it's it's an uneasy kind of meeting. It's not totally compatible. So what you get here is a sense of unease, uh, a lack of, um, you know, comfort that people are feeling. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my, to sharing my slides. Um, sorry, I'll have to find it now. So my questions on um, the yellow, uh, on uh, over the rainbow is, okay, um, she builds up the atmosphere of the journey to India, right? How did she do it? What did she do? Just name one thing.
So if you read the poem, there are references to Adida. There's a reference to Parleji. There's a reference to, you know, the, um, you know, getting out of the airport. She sees the city and she sees the children there. And she there's references to millions of languages that are spoken, right? So I think the poet is trying to create a way a sense of an India where, you know, it's multilingual. It's it's got problems like, you know, um, you may not recognize the English, but it is English all the same. And she feels a bit different um, in the film, uh, in the poem, a bit uneasy. So it's going back to the roots for her, isn't it? So um, we probably don't have the time now, but I'd like you to think of it in terms of uh, how does she talk about going back Okay. Um, was the poem difficult for you? Have I lost you there? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Look. I've left you the questions, and of course, I'm going to hand over all of these to your teachers who will share it with you. But I'd like you, when you're looking at the, these poems from the exam point of view or from any point of view, even as you know, a satisfactory read, consider these, it'll help you understand the poem. Okay, moving on to Michelle Cahill, um, and she writes five sejos. Um, and what I would like you to think about is, okay, I will just answer Mansi's question. Can you please explain, is she glorifying India or happy with her existence? I think that's a very good question, Mansi. My feeling is that she is neither glorifying um, India um, nor is she denigrating it, you know. For her, it is an ambivalent experience. She loves uh, being there, but at the same time, um, she doesn't, she can't make sense of it, you know. Um, that's, those are my thoughts, and we can take this up later on. Can we move on to Michelle's poem? Because it's slightly difficult. We're moving on to more difficult poems here. And um, so Michelle's poem, I'm going to sh uh, stop sharing this and uh, go back to the poem again, uh, is a sejo. A sejo is a um, poem which is written in um, what's called, um, um, it's a Korean form. Um, I wish I can find it back now. Okay. Would anyone like to read this poem for me, or should I read it for you? Okay, let me read it for you, okay? So as I was saying, Siju is a, a poem. Um, it is based on a, it's influenced by a Korean style of writing. Um, now, Generally, what happens in a sejo is that you have three lines. Each line consists of about 14 to 15 lines. And um, the first line is meant to be a kind of an introduction. The second one um, develops the story. And the third one actually is a kind of a coda or it um, you know, ends the thought or the feeling that the first two lines tried to create, okay? 
uh, ideally, a CJO is meant to be um, something that um, is meant to elicit an emotion from the reader. So here it goes. Five CJO for my reader. A sound of hooves over the dry stones of my sheets at night. My arms are withered. My bones rise to the quivering world in the space between our thoughts are three aching syllables. What do you make of it? What is she talking about? Anyone? It's a difficult poem, I agree. But let's see, come on, guess it. Treat it as a game. There are no right or wrong answers, come on, guess. No? Okay, let's go ahead and then see if you can come to some sort of an understanding of the poem. My almost lover, no photographs of you, no goodbye note, enemy. You have raided my country. Your handwriting floats downstream through the forest to the far walls of my kingdom. Does that give you any clue? Ma'am, is it a horrible dreaming? Yes, it could be a dream. You're right. What else can you say about it? Could be a dream. Is it horrible? Yes, ma'am. You think so? Okay. Your decrees are impulse. You enter without courtesy and I become your dynasty not knowing when to discern death by the penitence of leaves, by the halos of traffic. From the, from the far east, when the river broke, came rumors of a tribe. I was alone that dawn, milking the soya beans, harvesting rice with a bronze arrow you annexed to my body to this design. Which of us abandoned the other? We cannot answer. How quiet the apartment. Winsters, stars begin to shatter. Snow is a shizero, dancing over the words I've lost for snow. What's your impression of the poem? And sense of losing something. Yes, a sense of losing something. Um, anything else? Who's a raider? Who raids? What is a raid? Written, uh, Ria says, uh, written addressing the colonizers, possibly. What does Raider do? Ma'am, attacks something or someone. Uh, it, sorry, it attacks something or someone, did you say? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. 
it takes away things, right? Mm. And what else? Used to loot property forcefully, absolutely. What else do you think happens? Look, of all the poems, I found this.